join me in welcoming Peter Winsler. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks, Catherine, for your kind introduction, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here at this summit. Um, what I'm going to try to do in the next 10 minutes or so is give you an overview of how Bell Labs works. Bell Labs uh, has been around for uh, almost 100 years, and there is a lot of things that we can learn from the way Bell Labs has operated, especially regarding open innovation and open, uh, openness regarding industrial and academic borders. So there is one very good example for the spirit of Bell Labs, and that's reflected on the slide you see here. That shows the famous horn antenna of Crawford Hill, which was built uh, in 1960 to support the very first telecommunication satellite experiments. Satellites were invented by Bell Labs, telecommunication satellites, and first launched to, um, to do communications by Bell Labs back then. And in order to do so, to do the communications from ground to satellite to ground, uh, relay communications, they had to build uh, big horn antennas on the ground. Um, and then they also used them not just for satellite research, but also to uh, look beyond. So they saw, for example, that there was cosmic background radiation coming, microwave background radiation, and they couldn't explain it. So scientists, uh, Bob Wilson and Arno Penzias, they very carefully uh, measured that background radiation, and they could only reconcile it with theory um, by looking at the Big Bang Theory. And uh, the Big Bang Theory back then was very heavily disputed, but with that, uh, experiment that showed exactly how much background radiation there is from free space, they could prove that the Big Bang Theory was correct and from then on we know what the origin of our universe is. So all of that coming out of a telecom project which was called Satellite Communications. And that really captures what Bell Labs is all about. Think beyond. So to understand that even better, let's go a hundred years back. Let's look back um, when the telephone system wasn't existing. The telephone had been invented, but there was no network, there were no switches, no cables, no nothing. Everything had to be invented from scratch in order to deploy a massive uh, nationwide network. And Bell Labs was the research arm back then already for uh, AT&T and Western Electric to do the research that was necessary to invent all these little building blocks that make up a telephone network and later the internet. And Bell Labs always took the stance that it is important to extend general scientific knowledge because that will lead to many things unexpected that will create other industries. And um, in fact, that's what's happened. So you see here some of the milestones uh, that Bell Labs achieved while doing telecommunications research as its main focus. It had eight Nobel Prizes come out of this work, um, from electron diffraction to cosmic background radiation to the transistor, of course, the CCD, but then also other things that did not get a Nobel Prize for, but are at least as important, like uh, the Unix or the C language, all coming out of Bell Labs research. In optics, the erbium dot amplifier, or uh, in wireless, the multi-antenna MIMO systems. Let me just talk about the transistor a little bit. So the transistor was a very much planned invention. Back then in the 30s and even 40s, telephone systems worked by means of vacuum tube amplifiers. You see them to the very left. So those things were extremely power hungry, very unreliable, very fragile, and uh, AT&T was looking for a replacement for those that would be low power and uh, very robust. So in order to do so, they looked into solid state physics. And solid state semiconductor physics did not exist back then. So they had to invent the entire field of semiconductor physics. So that's very much a forward-looking scientific approach. And by 1947, uh, the first transistor was built. And that ushered in a totally new era, of course, as you all know. 10 years later, in 1956, one of the three transistor inventors, Bill Shockley, he was from Palo Alto and his ailing mother lived there, so he moved back to Palo Alto 
and set up his own shop to uh, build silicon transistors. And that, in fact, is the very start of Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley is a spin out of Bell Labs, if you want. <laughs> and that's all summarized uh, in a very nice book. This one, The Idea Factory, which I really encourage you to buy. I have the Kindle version and the paper version, but I like the paper version much better. Uh, so that's just me. Um, so I encourage you to, uh, to read that book where all these nice stories are in there. So going back, uh, going forward a little bit in, in time to more uh, recent examples of Bell Labs innovation, let's look at the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, uh, 10G was really the currency of uh, communications. There were, everything was 10G, maybe a little bit of 40G was around. And in 2005, Bell Labs had the very first 100G transmission experiment that we did in, in the labs. And two years later, together with Verizon, we demonstrated 100G technology in the field on a live link in Florida for the very first time. Why is that so important? That's important because it shows that, 10, that 100G technology could work on an existing network that was designed for 10G and maybe 40G. So that upgradability was the real proof that 100G has a future and can go forward. And indeed, in 2010, um, Bell has enabled Alcatel-Lucent back then to come out with the first 100G coherent product. That's this chip here, little chip that does all the digital signal processing that's necessary for 100G uh, transmission. And uh, with that chip, we had a two-year market lead compared to any other competition. And all of you know that two years is an eternity in high tech. So that just shows how forward-looking research can really help you in the marketplace as well. But obviously, we didn't stop there. Last year, we demonstrated the first terabit per second transmission over a single carrier channel. So that's not super channels or anything. That's one laser at terabit per second in the lab. Now, why is that important? Because traffic is continuing to grow. And this little table here just shows you how much growth you should expect. So the table answers the question, how long does it take for a 10x or 100x increase in demand if you have a certain yearly uh, tra demand growth? For example, take 40%. If you have 40% uh, per year growth, it means that in seven years you will need 10 times the amount of capacity or interface rate that you have today. And 100G was commercially available in 2010, so we expect one terabit to have to be available in 2017 at a 40% growth rate. Now, all of you will have other growth rates in your networks, so you, you pick your favorite number, you pick your favorite years, but none of these years is far away. So that's why really 10x and 100x research is extremely, extremely important to get, uh, keep the industry going. So the next interesting thing is uh, capacity of fiber. It was always believed that fiber capacity is infinite. You can send as much with WDM, as much down the fiber as you like. But if you look at this chart, and I only want you to focus on the top curve, that shows how the capacity of WDM increased in the 90s by 100% a year, and then it slowed down around 2000. So at first, we attributed that to the telecom bubble and maybe to some lags in research. But as this trend continued, we, get, we got really worried. And if we get worried at Bell Labs, we go back to the very basics. So what we did is we dug out Shannon's old paper, you know Shannon from the Shannon Limit, um, his 1948 famous paper, and extended it to the capacity of the fiber optic channel. And then if you plot that Shannon Limit of the fiber optic channel uh, as a function of the transmission distance, and you plot the experiments and the products available with it, you see that there is only a gap of a few factors, like factor of two, three, four, or even five. But a factor of five is nothing if a factor of 10 means seven years. Then a factor of five is nothing. So essentially, we are at the Shannon limit. And yes, fibers are therefore running out of capacity. And we are now asking, is there life beyond WDM? And again, in typical balance manner, we look very fundamentally at the physical dimensions that are available uh, to us and with, with the help of frequency and space, hope to find solutions that allow you to scale your networks further. Thank you.
Now I have the opportunity to ask you a few questions. That was really some very interesting innovation. And you said some very interesting things there about capacity. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how you think that's going to affect, what kinds of people is that going to affect? And what kind of impact is that going to have? So capacity uh, is very relative. It depends on which operator you're talking about. Obviously, there are operators that have very low demand right now, but then there are also ones that have very high demand and that have very high growth rate. Web scales typically have huge growth rates in their capacity demand, so they will be affected first. Some uh, incumbents might be uh, affected later, but it depends really on who you are, what your network is, what your growth rates are, but with that table I showed, you can very easily just pick your favorite growth rate, pick the one that applies to your network, and see what that means in terms of a 10x and 100x uh, technology increase over the years. Mm. And so what kind of things should we be doing? What should we be thinking about to address these challenges? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. And as, as you uh, saw, there are five physical dimensions that we can use to further scale uh, networks. And only two of them are really um, not exploited as of today. Uh, and that's frequency and space. In frequency, we can go to more amplification bands. Right now, we just have the C band uh, deployed in optical systems. We can go to C plus L band, maybe C plus L plus S band. So a factor of three or maybe four might be possible with some luck. And if you go to those uh, broadband systems, you can use sources like comb sources, for example, that to, to generate thousands of carriers uh, at the same time. So very new technology that uh, will come into play. And then once frequency is exhausted, you will really need to go to space, to the spatial dimensions, which to first order means parallel systems. I don't want to go into the more forward-looking scientific details of what spatial parallelism could mean, but uh, we can take that at another time. Okay, we'll definitely do that. So, so rather than going further into the future, let's talk a little bit about coherent. This was a key innovation that came from Bell Labs, and talk about how that technology, are there things that we can use, that we can implement from that chip, from the DSP chip, that would allow us benefits on the, at the network scale? Yeah, so Coherent really changed the picture. Coherent changed the picture in the sense that um, 10G had problems on certain links already with polarization mode dispersion, chromatic dispersion, and everybody thought with 100G you cannot do that with the existing fiber. But with DSP, you can now electronically compensate for all kinds of possible impairments that occur on the fiber, linear and nonlinear impairments, and 100G becomes a piece of cake on a link where 10G had to struggle. So DSP is really something that's, that opened up a lot of possibilities for existing links. At the same time, using DSP, you can open up uh, new interfaces, you can monitor the network, for example, if you imagine a backhoe nibbling at a fiber somewhere, a construction site, you can, the DSP will sense that. The DSP will sense the polarization rotation in the signal that corresponds to the backhoe digging uh, up your fiber cable. So even before the fiber break happens, well, well before the fiber break happens, you can now send the maintenance crew or call up the police or do whatever you want with your SDN interface and send, send somebody there to look what's going on or just proactively reroute the traffic to a safer route. And does it allow you to, to do any other things to make it more open? For an ex as an example, how about alien wavelengths? Yeah, so alien wavelengths means uh, sending uh, wavelengths of a different vendor than the one who actually built the line system mm -hmm. over your system. And with coherent technologies, this is also much easier than it used to be because, uh, again, coherent can compensate for impairments much more easily. So all, there's a lot of flexibility on various, various fronts that allow for openness uh, using coherent. So this is a lot of very interesting technology. I'm very excited about the technology, but there's also a business component here. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the early days of the transistor. And it wasn't just the technology, but it was also the business environment that enabled that innovation, that technology to really take off. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. Yeah. So the transistor back then was such a breakthrough invention, and uh, at and decided to give it away. They gave it away to, uh, the, to industry in the US, to industry all across the world, even to academia. 
uh, executives from AT&T and Bell Labs back then went around with samples of transistors and handed them out for people to play with. So that uh, device that was originally just meant to be a replacement for a linear amplifier had so many uses, including switches, as you all know, and now we have millions of transistors on a chip. Uh, that wouldn't have been possible without the freedom of giving away the intellectual property, essentially, and uh, giving samples away for people to play with. Yeah, so that's really a huge impact on the industry, so I think that's a really great accomplishment. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing your insights here on the innovation at Bell Labs. It's been very interesting. So, once again, I'd like everyone to thank Peter Vinza. Thank you. Thank you.